Well, friends, good morning. Warm welcome to our service of worship this morning. We're going to seek the Lord together and firstly sing in Psalm 44. The 44th Psalm, this is in Sing Psalms. Sing Psalms, page 54. We're going to be singing verses 1 to 8. This is Psalm 44, the beginning of the Psalm. And Sing Psalms, O God, we with our ears have heard. Our fathers told us so. What you accomplished in their days, in days of long ago. Your hand drove nations out and placed our fathers there instead. You crushed the peoples, but you caused her tribes to grow and spread. Notice verse 3. It wasn't by their sword or arm that they possessed the land, but by your love and favor shown, and by your mighty hand. The power of God at work. Let's sing Psalm 44, verses 1 to 8. O God, we with our ears have heard. <clears throat> o oh God, we with our ears have heard our Father told us so what you accomplished in their days, in days of long ago. Your hand drove nations out and placed our fathers there instead. You crushed the peoples, but you caused our tribes to grow and spread. It was not by their sword or arm that they possessed the land, but by your love and favor shown, and by your mighty hand. You are my King and God ordained for Jacob's victories. Through you we trampled down our foes and rout our enemies. My sword does not bring victory, nor do I trust my bow. You put our enemies to shame and overcome our foe. In God alone we make our boast, rejoice in all day long, and to your name forevermore we'll offer praise and song. Well, let's all pray and seek God together at this time. Lord our God, we have so much to thank you for us. We seek to come into your presence with words you've given us, historically sung and recited in Israel and recounting their own history and the great things that you had done. And we remember as well how you would have your people in these Old Testament times to remember your dealings. Not only did they remember, but they were to remember. And you 
among other things, appointed for them the Passover. That would be that annual reminder to them of their origin through your redemptive deliverance and taking them out from the house of bondage from the land of Egypt and bringing them into the promised land. And that psalm recounts the psalmist there remembering and reflecting on what you did and the great and the mighty miracles you accomplished on their behalf. That he, the psalmist, was saying there, as we were singing, that it wasn't the sword, my sword or my bow, it wasn't human ingenuity or things like that. Not that they weren't involved, but it was through your power and your hand, through the accompanying and the assisting, the enabling power of God. And it's all in fulfillment of that amazing promise you made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that not only would they possess this amazing land, but that ultimately they would be those through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed because of one descendant who was, you said, be, to be born from Abraham and who would come through Isaac. And the promises were there, and they seemed so personal to Abraham and his family, which they were, no doubt, in such a profound way, affecting his relationship with you and all of that meant for his life. But also the promise had a bearing on your people at, at large and how Israel were for the centuries looking for, waiting for the Messiah to come. But they had so fallen away and sunk into ignorance and drifted from the teaching of your word through these years between the Old and New Testament. That when the Messiah came, they didn't recognize him. He came, John tells us, unto his own people. His own people did not recognize him. And so they rejected him and ultimately crucified him because his claims, the claims of your son, the son of whom you said on these two occasions, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, that he is the one you sent, he is the one who came. He is the one who was empowered by the Holy Spirit for all that he did in his humiliation and in that dependence upon you as the servant of the Lord and coming in the likeness of sinful flesh and coming in the form of a servant being made in the likeness of men. He appeared no different. Maybe they were looking for something that was never promised in these prophecies where he was in this first coming to be seen in humiliation and rejection and shame which didn't tie up with their views of the ultimate and the final and the universal conquest that's yet to take place when the Messiah comes back, when the Christ, the anointed of God, returns. And then what these mistaken people thought would happen at the first coming will happen at the second coming. But we thank you to read these hints in Scripture that so inseparable are these two comings of Christ, that everything in between can be viewed as preparing for that second coming. And everything will be fulfilled, all that you have said, all that you have prom promised, all that the prophets and the apostles have revealed. Everything will come to pass. And life can be such a distraction from spiritual things for your people that the battle is always to be waged daily and sometimes constantly at periods of time. And we pray, Lord, for the strength to persevere and to keep going, irrespective of the situation that we might be in, and to realize, to maybe understand if we don't, that it's a test of faith, that it may not be your displeasure that you're hiding from us, but it may be the test of our faith, not that you need to know or testing for your benefit or knowledge, but for ours. We read that about Hezekiah, that you left him to see that he might see what was in his heart. Lord, help us, we pray, that we'd be preserved and kept and be able to walk in your ways. To be encouraged through your word today along this way, where there, there can be many discouragements your people meet, discouragements to their faith, discouragements, that, that um, things that can be discouragements to the next person at every day and may be regular. And so, Lord, we wish to pray for one another with a sensitivity 
to each situation and where, though it's so difficult, not knowing, having maybe never been in that exact place. We can pray out of the sense of personal situations, maybe, with that, though the circumstances are maybe different. Your people have been tried and tested, and we read in the psalm that you bring them through fire and water, (laughs) causing men, he says, to ride over their heads. But it's through that the psalmist says you bring them to a place of prosperity where spiritually they flourish and grow, and maybe circumstantially, like at the end of Psalm 18, David, in his relief from um, being delivered from all his enemies, is able to stop, catch a breath, and rejoice and worship in your deliverance. So help us, Lord, that we may realize something from the Scripture today of what you're saying to us in our lives. We pray that as we're here in this Word, as reading a part of Hebrews 11 into 12, that you will open the Scriptures to us in our reading And we'll see what we've never seen and understand, maybe what we've never understood. Not so much that we've been wrong all along, but certainly, Lord, if that's the case, that you'd show us. And that uh, we'd see the truth and be able to change our thinking and to be in line with what you're saying to us. But maybe with passages we, we can have read over the years. Or maybe some parts of the passages that seem so important to us and maybe speak in a personal way, in a a powerful way, or or have done. Praying that you will lead us further into the truths of these things, that we may be drawn by the Holy Spirit in our minds and hearts, our whole selves drawn into the meaning and the power of the Scriptures, as these are your words to us, the words of eternal life. And we pray, Lord, that we will know and even experience today something of that power. Remember those unable to join us. We pray for them. Again, Lord, those who would be joining us online, live, but where we have these internet issues just now. Remember them, Lord, part of the congregation, those who are our members, our adherents, people throughout our villages. And as far as we're told as well, and what the, the joy of knowing the people in other parts of Scotland and even the world. But Lord, at this time, we pray for them. That you remember all who are in need today. We're all in need, but some needs are greater. And do you think, Lord, of those needs that are life-affecting and debilitating? Where sickness, immobility, and maybe the mind being fully, thankfully, fully functional, and yet the body being so weak. And uh, like at the end of Ecclesiastes, Solomon describes, though it's not, although he's talking there, what you told him to tell us about old age and the infirmities and the weaknesses and in the mental, the physical, and the emotional problems that can come. Someone living their life without God and then coming to the end of it and thinking, what a waste. And feeling all of the pains and all of the weaknesses and everything seeming maybe physically to slow down. But for your people, how amazing to read like we can in such as the writings of Paul that though our outward man, he said, is perishing, our inward man is being renewed day by day. And he looked at his body as being clothes to be put off at death and for him to be reclothed with resurrection body at, on the last day. Or speaking of his death as, a tab, as, as his body, as a tent, which at death would be taken down. Things that we can stop and reflect on for a time and see death in a completely different way and for Paul and for your people there in scripture it seems so clear to them that they had such a powerful perception of unseen reality that it could affect them in the present life so profoundly we pray for this for your word to truly set us free in every situation in life that we may know the liberty of the spirit where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty, freedom in thought, in expression, in feeling, in so much. So we pray that we all would know that just now, that like David in Psalm 51 prays that you would open his closed lips. We so often feel like that. We have amazing words to sing, but our hearts can be so far away. 
But we might come to church feeling so cold and and uh, there have been times maybe leaving problems in life or situations overhanging or hanging over and we maybe feel it hard to concentrate for whatever reason. That you grant, Lord, that ability to be truly present and to be engaged in mind and feeling and thought and in every respect and that we might be able to concentrate. Remember the children, Lord. Thank you for them. Remember them all on holiday, those not here today and families uh, usually here and as well others who would be with us. We pray for them. Those who are away just now and those who may be going away in the future in these times, grant your blessing, Lord, and safety over all our people. And uh, your blessing as well, Lord, upon those who are who are grieving. We think, Lord, today of those known to us, belonging to us, and those we've maybe known who have passed away and at times are reminded of family and friends, different points in life at different ages. We pray, Lord, for help to reflect on ourselves here today as we consider your truth and also to remember those who've gone home We've gone to be with the Lord. It'll be a great blessing, we pray, as we remember them all so, all so often, and some maybe daily. And there are some here who, who know grief and sorrow and mourning like, like some of us don't. But we pray that in each individual need that you would meet, Lord, and draw near to them with that special and that unique comfort that no human can give. We pray, Lord, for our times, seeing the riots in France, the failed attempt at integrating different faiths and different cultures, and how racism is so often the word that's thrown about, where crime is maybe minimized. But we, we live in times that are so difficult, and we pray, Lord, for the many people who thinking particularly of the strong Muslim presence in France among the young people who are trying to fight, though we don't hear so much about this in the, our own national press, of the reason behind so many, not just this tragic death and the ensuing riot, but historically in France, the social upheavals and the riots have been similarly from people of immigrant origin and problems being caused and societal upheavals. But Lord, we pray for France for the government, for the military, for the police. We pray for the protesters, for the young, the growing up, desecrating synagogues in their, in their going. We don't hear about it. And breaking into an evangelical church and smashing things up and putting graffiti everywhere. The Lord, we don't hear, but we. some of your people are able to give insight, not only there, but the like of what's happening in Ukraine, things we hear. We hear what people want us to hear. And we're given a narrative to believe something that's maybe biased or one-sided. Lord, we thank you that you know everything and we can pray. And even where it's not possible for us to know or understand, but to be able to pray for those who are in need and for your hand upon a society, a people, a nation, the continent of Europe and the West. Lord, we're drifting from you. We have drifted. and glad to be at the end of a pride month with all of this the anti-God and anti-Bible, anti-Christian, satanic attempts. And it isn't, Lord, we know, it isn't simply people of a given lifestyle, whatever anyone might think of it, but the agenda that's driven to take our children. And people don't maybe believe or accept that such is the case. But to realize the darkness of these movements, a religion all of its own, and it's frightening, so distorted. We pray, Lord, that you would grant your blessing as our society and as the church has to face these things more and more. And as schools and teachers and our children, even in primary schools, we're having, having, to, we're having to think about, consider, and even parents having to see material before material being actually taught. Lord, we pray that in these days of increasing judgment you will remember mercy you have your plan for this time and this is our generation so lord we're not meaning to lament and 
in the sense of be hopeless, but praying that you would work, that you will not abandon your cause, but you will bring and establish your kingdom. Lord, that we think as well like the motto the city of Glasgow had once and how it was the desire that the city would flourish through the preaching of your word and the praising of your name. And to see the Union Jack taken down in London for pride flags to be displayed in its place. What is it all saying about our nation, our people? And, oh Lord, the colours are everywhere and people don't realise, even where people have a completely different outlook or what, what's called orientation, all of these things. We see them wearing the clothes at work. We see them having to endorse it or promote it. Many of them, even friends, and they don't realise what they're doing. And we wouldn't realise. We never did. We're not better than anyone else. You know we're not saying that. We thank you that Paul has said that on one occasion he was less than the least of all the saints. And he knew it. And he had that attitude. It is, However, Lord, it's not looking at the others from a position of thinking we're better. But you know we pray and we ask for divine intervention to change hearts in our society. And praying for divine intervention in days of very obvious declension. Lord, come to us, we pray. And remember us as we meet for the short time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we continue in singing just now? We'll sing from uh, Psalm 119, 119. And this is in Scottish Psalter, uh, Psalm 119, page 411. Scottish Psalter, we have a verse 129. Psalm 119, verse 129, and page 411. Thy statutes, Lord, are wonderful. My soul them keeps with care. The entrance of thy words gives light, makes wise, who simple are. My mouth I have wide opened and panted earnestly, while after thy commandments I longed exceedingly. Let's sing the section 17 from verse 129 to verse 136. Thy statutes, Lord, are wonderful. Thy statutes, Lord, are wonderful, my soul them keeps with care. The entrance of thy words gives light, makes wise who simple are. My mouth I have wide open it and panted earnestly while after thy commandments I longed exceedingly. Look on me, Lord, and merciful. Do thou unto me prove, as thou art wont to do to those thy name who truly love. O oh, let my footsteps in thy word aright still ordered be. Let no iniquity obtain dominion over me. From man's oppression save thou me, so keep thy laws I will. Thy face make on thy servant shine, Teach me thy statutes still. 
Rivers of water from mine eyes did run down when I saw how wicked men run on in sin and do not keep thy law. Let's read together from the letter to the Hebrews. Hebrews 11. We'll read into part of chapter 12, the first two verses of 12. Firstly, let's read chapter 11, Hebrews 11, and at verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found, because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. He went out, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she had considered him faithful who had promised. And therefore from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith the people crossed the Red Sea, as on dry land. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. 
By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they'd been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, and so on. May God bless our reading as we turn to his word this morning. We're going to turn now to Psalm 37. Psalm 37, this is Scottish Psalter, and uh, it's on page 254. Scottish Psalter, page 254, and it's Psalm 37, and we're at verse 23 down to verse 30. A good man's footsteps by the Lord are ordered aright, and in the way wherein he walks he greatly doth delight. Although he fall, yet shall he not be cast down utterly, because the Lord with his own hand upholds him mightily. Let's sing from verses 23 to, from verse 23 down to Verse 30. A good man's footsteps by the Lord are ordered aright, and in the way wherein he walks, he greatly delight. Although he fall, yet shall he not be cast down utterly, because the Lord with his own hand upholds him my I have been young and now am old, yet have I never seen the just man left, nor that is seed for bread a beggar. He's ever merciful and lends His seed is blessed therefore Depart from evil and do good And dwell forevermore For God loves judgment, and his saints leaves not in any case. They are kept ever, but cut off shall 
be the sinner face. The just in it shall the land and ever in it dwell. The just man's mouth doth wisdom speak, his tongue doth judgment tell. Well, let's turn back to our reading. We can uh, reread in chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, the, the words in verse 2. We can reread these words, which really add a summary conclusion of what's been said in the verses before. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Faith is something that can be very hard to explain or well, because of the fact that it's very hard maybe to understand. Real faith is not meaning believing something to be true and um, being persuaded of the fact that something is real. You're aware that you're here just now. You're aware that you're sitting down. You believe it's true because the evidence says as much. But when it comes to the Bible and thinking about faith, there is, of course, a different approach to it, meaning, of course, that the things the Bible is bringing before us, God and eternal realities and spiritual realities, are by their very nature largely um, invisible. So there's no way of looking and quantifying or, you know, assessing something. And for that reason, people sometimes... Young ones growing up are going to be faced with the outcome of this process. And as they go older and older, they'll be faced with the process itself. Of how many people in our society and leading influential figures and education signs and so on, being largely atheistic, the, the thought of faith or belief is looked down on where something can't be analyzed or assessed and defined to the satisfaction of the unbelieving mind. And so the Christian faith, the Bible, can very often be uh, attacked for and, and Christians can be attacked we read off some of these things in Hebrews 11 towards the end it was for their faith the fact that they were faithful and loyal to God Satan hates God he hates God's people and so he'll do everything possible to make things difficult uh, for them or to try and bring what they're doing to an end he tries to discourage the rebuilding of the wall in the Old Testament after the exile he tries to discourage in so many different ways, he's there in the prophecy of Zechariah. Is he not the accuser of the brethren? The one who accuses. He doesn't want you to have any peace. Doesn't want you to have any happiness. And in the world, he wants everyone to believe that God doesn't exist. And isn't it, isn't it crazy to even think about you have the, the church of Satan very much established in America. And doing lots of things and having public uh, images on display that they've got a right to. And if you open these, this is the, the tragic thing, if people's rights that don't exist but are believed to exist, if this, the government society opens the door, as it were, to provide acceptance to one, then the whole lot are going to come in. That's what's happening. But uh, the, the thing with that is you'll find that Satanists, and part of their scheme and part of their cunning is to tell you they don't, they don't believe in the personal Satan. It's what he represents. The promise of knowledge given to Eve in the garden. That's the whole thing. It's knowledge. It's religion and God and the Bible are restrictive. It's everything Satan said in the Garden of Eden. The grass is greener on the other side. And so with all of that, and there's many, many, many complicated um, uh, analyses of these things, but being very simple ab about our, our approach and just to try and understand that that has being, been Satan's attempt from the beginning into the present time. You know, the Corinthians were told this just before we move on that uh, anticipating people saying, well, Paul, if your gospel is so amazing as you've just been saying in the earlier chapters in 2 Corinthians, why do more people not believe what you're saying to them? This can be the challenge, and Christians can be faced with it. Y your Bible isn't very powerful, is it? It's not, very, it's not having the reach 
It's not having the effect of the influence that, that it once did in people's lives and in society. There's, of course, reasons for that. The sovereignty of God, God moving in places. The fact that we know that's the reason is because we cannot change anyone. Paul planted, Apollos watered. It's God who gave their growth. Yes, the planting and the watering. Absolutely, that is the calling. But the growth and the increase, the seed goes in. We thought of it last Sunday night, but we cannot affect the growth. Sometimes it may seem to lie dormant for years, maybe decades, and then the person comes and is able to do that. The whole problem we can struggle with, with faith, is that the arguments that people bring against faith, against the existence of God, against believing the Bible, they appeal to our fallen hearts. Religion appeals to our fallen hearts. The real faith, the living and, and the true God, having revealed in, in the Bible the gospel to us, revealing the message of the cross. We're told that the, the message of the cross is offensive necessarily. It's meant to be offensive. It's not that you go out of your way to offend people. But what, what Paul is saying, I think, is that the nature of the message, meaning we are sinners and we need a perfect substitute to save us, and that God has provided that perfect substitute, it's offensive. It's offensive, the Corinthians are told, to the religious mind, to the Jews as a stumbling block. It just gets in the way. You know, you're running, walking, you trip over something. You just can't get past it. It doesn't make sense. A suffering savior, it doesn't make any sense. And so to the Jews, they, they were blinded by their own religion and feeling superior than other people who weren't Jews or weren't us in the Pharisee and the tax collector. As it goes, they had a high view of themselves. And so to be told they need faith in someone else who is perfect in order for their imperfection not only to be forgiven, but for his perfection to be given to them in exchange, all by faith. It's offensive. I'm good enough. Thank you, Lord. I'm not like other men, other women. I don't do this. I don't do that. And I'm certainly not like this tax collector. When God opens our eyes, we see ourselves in a different light. And we, because we see him in a different light. But our fallen hearts don't want to accept the truth of the gospel because it's offensive. To the Jew, it was offensive. To the Greek or the sophisticated, the philosophically um, uh, uh, geared, it was to them foolishness. It just didn't make sense. And the gospel doesn't make sense to the natural mind. And by the natural mind, it's not an offense to you or to anyone else that, that's intentionally been, been made because we were all in this position. There was that time where we all didn't have a clue. It didn't make sense. It was ignorance. It was lostness. It was blindness. Nothing made sense. The religious person is offended. And the wise, the intellectual, the scientific will mock at it. So it's going to be rejected. The Bible's making these two approaches. Why is it rejected in Corinth? Well, the religious people are, are offended by it. And the, the philosophical people, the educated people, the high flyers, they just think it's a joke. Has anything changed? Second Peter 3, the warnings given it's through all the New Testament age until the Lord comes back. The people will say, where is, where is this coming? Where is the promise? The argument goes, everything's carried on since it did from the beginning of creation. But the people forget, willingly, he says, both creation itself proves God's existence and the flood proves God's divine judgmental intervention in human history in the past. Meaning on both of these, there is no, for both of these reasons, there's no grounds whatsoever for people to say, where is his coming? Because he's never intervened before. The scoffing, the mocking, Peter says. People mock it because we'd rather reject it. And we say, how many times I've maybe said this, and forgive me saying it again, but see, sometimes when we're in the cemetery, at the most difficult points of some people's, I see some of the things people talk about. Even outside the church when we're waiting to gather. And, and uh, again, this, this isn't coming down or speaking down at anybody because none of us naturally would ever have. You, I remember being at funerals before I was converted. At friends' funerals, I'm sure you, you were as well when you were young and growing up, but as unconverted, you don't want to have to think about death. You don't want to have to go to church if, if you're not a church goer. You have to go to a funeral. You have to go to a wedding. You maybe don't want to go. 
And you want to push it all away unless you have to. Is that how it feels? If there's a reluctance, and, and the reluctance and, and the hesitation is because, not because there's any legitimate reason. We make excuses. You know, we can be in church and still feel like this. We can still feel wish we were somewhere else. When we're growing up, maybe it can feel like that. The time might come, it might not come, but it may come. And if, when it happens, it's showing what's in our hearts. It's showing the anti-God bias. And in fact, it's nothing worse than hatred of God that we have. I remember hearing that in seminary. It was a new, being taught working through New Testament. And as a teacher then, he mentioned this about Romans, uh, Romans 7. Christians differ on what's being referred to whether it's Paul unconverted or converted, who says, wretched man that I am. The good I want to do, I don't do. The evil I don't want to do, I do. Like cross purposes almost, and the contradiction and the agony and the struggles that he's feeling. He's going through that. And the question, when we look at him, and he sees himself, and he gives a clear admission to something that that's happened. The way he changes, he's been made to, to be changed in his own outlook. The natural mind, this is in second, this is in First Corinthians 2, the natural mind does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. That's the explanation. That's not the verse I was thinking of a minute ago. I couldn't find the verse that was there, but it's, it's that in second, it's First Corinthians 2, when you think of it, and that the reason we were all in that position, wanted to push it all away, want nothing to do with it, and Satan blinding us on top, of, in, in, in addition to that. Why do people not believe the gospel? They can't. Satan doesn't want them to. And what they'll do is um, make people who are believers and people who are trying to follow the Lord, um, some people can make it very difficult for them. That's what we're reading, the challenges that can come the way of faith. And growing up, children will more and more be faced with the outcomes of an atheistic worldview. We're seeing that where all of these things can come, whatever it is, whatever expression it may take, be it religious or otherwise, it's all religious when you think in, in terms of people uniting around a common goal and the, the way it's done and, you know, it's proclaiming a message, it's proclaiming an ideology, it's forcing it down your throat, it's making you want have to, or trying to force you to accept it. I don't know if you know, knew, maybe you've heard of the uh, minister down in England who had his bank, bank closed. Because the, with a bank, you know, you get things with insurers and all that. So I'm asking like a, a kind of review. How, how, are, how are we doing? How do you think we're doing? Now, he used to get these things, he said. Uh, and with Pride Month, he thought, well, because the bank, I can't remember the name of just now, something Yorkshire. If you search this up, you'll see the man was on GB News. He was talking about this just the other day. Um, Nigel Farage is saying the same thing, but maybe for slightly different reasons. But anyway, this man filled in the kind of questionnaire and said, well, I really don't think... Um, that, that while you've been in charge of finance, my finance for so many years, I, I really don't think this is basically anything to do with what you are as a bank. So you're pushing this. And the next thing was told, got a letter, and he was told to remove what was his and to go somewhere else, that, we, that, that the, our agreement basically is now terminated. We're not on the same level. Can you believe that? A minister in the UK writing to a bank saying, I don't really think you should be, I mean, this isn't his words, I haven't got a quotation, but you can see it, you can see the man talk, different news outlets, and, and you'll see it in, maybe in print as well. But he, he had his bank account closed with a, with a bank he'd been with for years because he, he said to them, I don't think you should be pushing this agenda. He said it very graciously, very politely, and that's the outcome. That's, the, that's where we're living. And this isn't our next, this is, the, this, is when you, this is the beginning of these things. You know, the legislation that would, would soon come on you or me. We're not, you're not allowed to say things. What are police wasting resources and time? You think about this, we're going off, uh, but it's related. It's an anti God and unbelieving bias and religion. This is what we're trying to get. The Christian is to be looking to Jesus, looking by faith. The heroes there in the Old Testament, with all their imperfections, they accomplished amazing things. God did great things through them by faith. And yet people will ridicule you if you're a Christian you don't, because you don't believe what they believe in. Yeah, well, wait a minute. You believe in it too, in the sense that you have faith in what you believe in. So don't ridicule me for faith. When you have faith in itself, faith, yeah, that's a kind of argument in its own way. That's never looked at. Faith is spoken of as being like a crutch or something 
that the un, 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 non-intellectual people need. If you're not, you don't know what's going on. You need this religious stuff to kind of make you feel a bit better. But all of these ideologies, you think about, you think about the colours, you think about the promotion. It's all religious, and they don't realise Satan is behind it. Do we realise that ourselves? Mentioned it the other time. If you haven't looked at the statue of Baphomet, that symbol, the goat's head, you see the pentagram, and you can see parts of a woman's chest, but it's a male goat. Think about that. And the picture there was the Church of Satan, I remember which United U.S. city, and they were wanting to have that mentioned a while a statue in place. It's basically like you'd have a Christian. Um, symbol in a, in a given, given place, like, they, like it, you would have it in Glasgow, the motto of Glasgow years ago, for everyone to see. And now this, and there's two children looking up. This is all that's wanted. Sir, if you want to look at these things, you can see, you can see it all. And there are people who are very expert in all of these things. They, it's their, maybe their calling, their emphasis, and maybe they're involved in trying to witness to and, and help people who are caught in that trap. Our minds and our hearts, we're saying, are naturally against God. Not just that there is that unwillingness on our part to believe, but that there's actually, and this is where it's complicated because we can't explain it, it's, a, it's, act, it's not just an, an unwillingness, but there's actually an impossibility. It's an impossibility. If people ask, why talk about things like that when the gospel calls people to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and to be saved? And then you're saying, well, you can't believe by yourself. You're, we're looking at the same thing from two angles. Because the emphasis in the gospel, is it not your responsibility and mine, what we have to do? And we are told to believe. We don't sit down and analyze and wait for something to happen or make sense and then yield ourselves to it or commit ourselves to it. We're not to be waiting for, for anything to happen to us. That's indirectly and maybe unintentionally mocking God when he's told you and he's told me what to do. And we don't do it. And we say we can't. And we can't. But why do we go to him about it? If he's the only one who can help us and give us faith, give us that ability to believe and enter into, as Jesus said, through the new birth, unless one is born again, which is first, the new birth, they cannot see, perceive the kingdom of God or enter the kingdom of God. The new birth brings faith and it brings um, unseen and spiritual reality to bear on us in a life-changing way and hopefully in an increasing way. But without faith, we read in, in, the, in the chapter, chapter 11, without faith it is impossible to please God. Impossible. Because faith involves dependence and trust and commitment to him. There's many ways to look at this impossible uh, to have, you know, because the Bible will, will speak of or illustrate faith from so many different angles. It's like looking at a diamond from many different angles and seeing the different. In fact, Peter uses a similar word. Um, and he's talking about God's grace. He speaks the word, it's like multifaceted or multicolored. When he's talking about the, the abundance of God's grace. And it's like that, looking at it and appreciating it from a, a different point in life, a different experience, the same thing viewed from a different angle. So finding a definition can be so difficult. In a sense, we may want to think about trying to, from the Bible that is, find a definition of the Trinity. It's not possible because while the truth is revealed in Scripture, it's not stated in any one particular passage with all the teaching of Scripture brought into one place. But thinking about faith and thinking about how it's in everyone's life to a degree faith as faith but not living faith what makes the difference why is a believer said to be a believer is it just that they intellectually like in your mind you say oh i accept that to be true not at all it's, it's a life-changing thing we, we were reading that in chapter 11 faith is the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen. So even in these words, hope and invisibility are involved. There's so much throughout Hebrews chapter 11. When it says hope, faith is the substance. It says in the ESV, the assurance of things hoped. It says in the King James, that faith is the substance 
of, of things hoped for. And what the substance, one word the, uh, under, under, underneath the English. And substance, it, it really means it's something that holds it. It's like a foundation. Like something that stands underneath. Something that, that supports. Something that enables and undergirds. It's like the wise man building his house on the rock. Or the foolish building his house on the sand. It's where the foundation is present. And uh, that's what faith is said to be. It's Faith gets hold of things. Faith perceives things. Faith is persuaded by things. You know the way the catechism, the, the catechism talks about effectual calling? It involves, and this is really what it comes down to, isn't it? The work of the Holy Spirit. How it's through the Word of God, maybe over time, maybe suddenly, we become, and it doesn't happen the same way to everyone, but there, there, there's, there, there's involved in it, there's a persuasion. There's a conviction. There's an enabling. These words are used where, where, we, where we become enlightened, where we become convicted. We become persuaded. and We become enabled. We become those in whom God is at work. And things that didn't make sense to us, we'll come back to this tonight, God willing, though a lot of other things will still not make sense, the main things that didn't make sense will start to make sense. Like the woman in John 4, she just couldn't believe what she had heard. She couldn't believe that she had just met the Messiah. And she was talking to him. But it wasn't happening. You know, you can have it sometimes. We can, you can have it with your children. They say, well, they, what, not wedding, but praying and why the Lord isn't answering. And Well, you know, he's trying to say, you, you ask, you're asking the Lord to meet him. It's him you've got to be looking for before everything else. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. All these things will be added. Put the Lord first. All of this will work out. Faith, it has that amazing way of making the invisible visible. Don't be disgusted. See, when people, people might get on your case, or you, not personally, but we're hearing it. We are, Satan so subtly through the media, through the influences, even from the children's things that they see all the way through. It's, it's just this influence of the media driving this. It's all that is in the world, John said. And in case you think, what's he talking Well, we maybe wonder that sometimes, anyway, but we're trying to share, hopefully, only what, what God is saying on this. And like John, First John, he says, all that's in the world, the mindset, it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the desires, and the pride of life. Isn't it? It's quite interesting. The pride of life. Living in utter defiance of God doesn't mean living an anti-Christian life, saying anti-Christian things, but living as though God didn't exist. That's just as bad. The reason, among others, it's so bad is that God has not left himself without witness in this world. Romans 1 says the creation testifies to the existence of God. And we're without excuse in that sense. But there's a, a way where explanations for God you know people go back and because there's a mental block eternity is something we being so limited can cannot even begin to fathom to the point that I remember you did um, John Lennox and Richard Dawkins did debating and what a, what a fantastic thing that you know I've heard of Richard Dawkins and he's very not just unsympathetic he's very hostile to to the Christian faith and um, John Lennox it's in the University of Oxford. I think he was a professor of mathematics, if I remember right. But hearing them talk together was so fascinating. But one of the quite pathetic arguments that someone said is, where did God come from or who created God? And that is actually used in a, in a debate by some of the most intellectual people on the face of the earth. Like intellectually, scientifically, as far as these things go, they've got a profound insight to a lot of things. But nobody, the Christian, the Bible, no one says God came from anywhere. It says the opposite. In the beginning, God. Genesis um, 1, 1. And then we have the same thing in, in John chapter 1. Similar words. Meaning the, and highlighting the pre-existence of, of the Trinity. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God in the beginning. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. He was 
the agent of creation, the divine word, the son of God. And he was in pre-existence with the father before creation because in the beginning, God. So he was there before time and space existed. What's the problem? Well, you see, people have a presupposition. They're coming to the thought of the Bible with, already having, made, with having already made their minds up. It is impossible based on evidence that the argument would go for God to exist or for creation to have happened or anything like that. And one of the reasons you can think they bring, and you'll hear about this, is the argument along the, the, the lines of the distant starlight, how long it takes light to travel over a distance. And if we kind of reverse that for light traveling the speed we know to reach from here to here on earth from a given star or a given galaxy that's X number of light years away, it needs X amount of time. So for X amount of time to have taken place, we need to have been around for all of these years. Now, if God didn't exist, that would be the only kind of viable explanation of how things could have been if we didn't, you know, of course it couldn't happen if God didn't exist, but you know what I'm trying to say. When God created Adam, was he a child? When he created the trees where they planted, when he created the sun and the moon and the stars, he created them as mature light was already on the earth at the creation. God created life. That's the first thing he said, let there be light. And there was light. How long did it take? The children, how long do you think it took for God to create the light? He said, and it was done. And the evening and the morning were the first day. What's the problem? See, we don't want to accept it. We don't want to believe it because it means I'm accountable to God. It means I've got to give my life to God. It means one day I'm going to meet him. And it means I've got to sort myself out before then. So let us eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. It's not the way the world is. And do everything, just block in our ears like the executioners of Stephen when he was martyred. They block in, you can see them block in their ears, foaming at the mouth. And you've maybe seen Christians trying to bear witness at some of these marches and some of these protests, and you'll have people bawling in their ear when they're trying to share the gospel, bawling in their ear. Can you imagine that? If someone's ever shouted in your ear, you know how that makes you feel. The provocation. But you know, if, if God didn't exist, if, if Christianity wasn't real, Richard Dawkins and all of these people, we'd have nothing to protest about, really. Protesting against something that you believe to be wrong, that has been believed to be right up until now, by and large. What kind of faith is needed to believe what the whole trans movement believes? What kind of faith is needed to believe that any of that is true? It's outrageous. Biblical faith is real faith. It is based on objective reality and fact. Creation testifies of God. Providence testifies of God. Experience testifies of God. Ultimately, the Bible testifies of God. And when all of these things coalesce and dovetail in a life, it's amazing, isn't it? Because it makes sense. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. It doesn't make real what's imaginary. It makes clear to your mind what is invisible and what is eternal. It's a powerful thing, faith. And we take it for granted. We, to think about it too much can be too much. Because we can cope with so much, even of these spiritual things, can't we? And, um, and go no further. At the end of this, where does this leave us? Where, do, where, does, where does this make us, make us stop? Well, it's to be, hopefully, to be encouraged. We're thinking, generally, briefly, of, a, of the, the difficulties that are facing us in these times, and we'll no doubt more and more in, in different ways, and other aspects with technology and artificial intelligence and digital superpowers, and, you know, at some, you know, the, the, the problems 
largely that uh, unintentionally and even your likes of Elon Musk behind all, most of these things, vast intelligence, and they're scared of it. They're scared of where it's going to go if it's not stopped or controlled. Among other reasons, no one's going to know whether what's being said or reported is true, either in speech, text, or in audio, or in video. A lot of these things can happen where things are fake, or things are spun, and the tragedy is maybe not knowing the difference. How, how do we, or how are we to face, not just face these things, but to live day by day? Well, it's by faith, isn't it? It always has been. But to be encouraged, we're, we're to be reminded, uh, to be reminding ourselves, because we are reminded about the, all of these Old Testament heroes, and, and they were imperfect people. In case we look at them and think of them, picturing them in an arena when we're running the race of faith, and there they are, Moses and Sarah and Rahab and Abraham. You're going to see David, you're going to see Samson, you're going to see compromised, questionable people, and there they are. They've come through life, they came through their trials, they overcame in the end, and the reason was because Jesus is the author and the finisher of their faith, the, 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 the initiator. It's not, I don't think some people say that, that Hebrews, you know, speaking at, Hebrews 12 is speaking about Jesus as the example, the one who run the race, and we're to be looking to him for encouragement, the one who shows what the beginning and end of a race of faith looks like. Well, that would have been true in his, our Lord's experience, but it's different for, I think it's meaning like in Philippians 1, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Perseverance is guaranteed because of God's work, not because of us. We have to keep going. and We have to try to keep looking to him. This is the, the other thing. Being encouraged by people in the Old Testament, being encouraged by their example, by their overcoming, and all of these amazing things, and what God did through their lives, and for us in the present, being encouraged by the memory of their example to also be looking forward, looking back and looking forward. It's not even forward. It's forward in terms of our race. And you've got the prize at the end, running, looking to Jesus. He's there. He is the goal. He is the prize. But the word looking, it actually means a compound word. It's looking away. I think that says everything. There's, there's, there's are not looking at anything else. You know what it's like when you're looking and there you've got, you know, peripheral vision. You know that, you know, whether it's someone looking or there's something going on and you just get, you can get distracted. To be totally focused when there is so much to distract and, and sin and, and weights and that the writer's saying there's so much to hinder us and keep us from making progress. But let's put away sin. Let's put away what encumbers us, anything in life that's holding us down getting in the way. Let's run with perseverance, with patience, the race that's set before us. What God has for you, it's planned. And he's calling on us to go through it. And he's calling on us to go through it together. He's speaking to Christians in, in, in totality and to Christians as um, just bearing one another's burdens. You go into chapter 12 and 13, it, it makes that very clear. We're just finishing, just wanting to, to think of this, looking away to Jesus. It's not butting our head in the sand. It's not doing that at all. That's not what faith is, pretending things are other than they are or, or wishing it to go away or pretending things are good until uh, the bad thing goes. But it is so possible to be in the very midst of difficulty and, and opposition and tests and for faith to flourish. And sometimes it's in these times, is it not? For someone to be able to be truly, truly rejoicing in the most dire circumstances in life is, is, is miraculous. When, when you think of, of how it can be, you've got, you've got Paul and Silas in Philippi in, in jail. They've been, they've been interrogated. They've been beaten quite severely. Uh, we know that because their wounds need to be cleaned when they're in the jailer's house later on. But at midnight, when they're, they're shackled, they're actually shackled in the inner prison, and they would have been in such pain. Ordinarily, you'd think, but they're worshiping God. They're praising, they're, they're praying and singing hymns at midnight in jail. How is that possible? God is real. Christ is present. And they're lifted above what's going on. Faith can make the invisible visible, the unimaginable 
possible. And sometimes things that seem so contradictory to us, they make perfect sense. When Peter was taken out of the, the, the jail, we, we read the other, we were reading recently, um, the other prayer meeting, week before last, wasn't it? We were in Acts. No, it wasn't, to do, it wasn't to do with that. We were thinking of it last Sunday morning, sorry. But we're thinking of, of um, when Peter was set free from prison and when he came to the house where the people were praying and Rhoda came to the door, uh, Peter came to the door and Rhoda went to hear the, who was knocking. She saw Peter went in and said, Peter's there. It's the way that Peter was experiencing these amazing deliverances and how you can see even some of these greatest people, for them, faith and trust in even the most impossible of circumstances. We need to remember this. Faith, faith that when things are going, faith, you know, there's, there's, you talk about maybe the back burner kind of thing, but where things are really tough, like Peter in prison, he's about to be killed the next day, like, just like Stephen had. And the, morning, the night before he's going to be taken out to be executed, the angel comes to him and opens the, and, and, and leads him out. The, the prison doors open. The impossible can happen. Don't ever think, if it ever crosses your mind, don't ever think that God cannot do this, whatever it is. And being reconciled to that fact and trying to wait, trying to wait on him to show that amazing power. We read on, on Wednesday, the Lord did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. What we make of that is very difficult. He says, according to your faith, be it unto you. So we're challenged to be encouraged. And sometimes the encouragement, we need to force ourselves to be encouraged. When things are difficult, things are maybe oppressive and getting increasingly dark and hostile, you know, think of the generation coming after you, please, when we're doing this. Because they, we have no idea what they're going to face in many respects. We can only maybe think. And the roller coaster is happening, and there are people with fingers on the pulses who know that in terms of... Uh, well, in many different respects, but we must be praying and that we must be trying to be encouraged and to be encouraging others. And they will see your faith and mine and they'll see where we can't believe and we struggle and we're broken and we don't know what to do. That's what you find in, in Hebrews 11. Read about Samson and David, Abraham. Their lives were far from perfect. They had massive lapses of faith, but there they are. Be encouraged. Keep going looking away to Jesus, whatever else is happening, keep looking to him. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord our God, we don't really understand, but the little we know, what you've shown, we can see that the scripture is, like in Jesus speaking, on more than one occasion we're told that People who are viewed as the, 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 the sinners and the tax collectors that were told they glorified God. They glorified the word of God. There was that hearty response of acceptance and gladly praising you for what you've done. And we pray, Lord, to be in that place before you where we're able to, to bow in your presence and to worship and to find that Faith reaching, as it were, and laying hold of you. Even when, because we can't, we can't maybe change what's happening, change hearts, change lives, change in any real spiritual way, but for your work and your power to come and continue. Remember us, Lord, families, homes, societies, praying for your blessing. Don't leave us and don't forsake us. These times, Lord, we only know fractionally the, what we're facing. But you have planned everything, and there's nothing out of your control. Nothing's happening apart from your will. But for us to see and even be part of what you're doing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing some verses from Psalm 16. We conclude with Psalm 16. 16, sing Psalms.
and this is page 17. Psalm 16, page 17, and from verse 8, the answer to so much. Before me constantly, I set the Lord alone. Because he is at my right hand, I'll not be overthrown. Let's sing the end of the psalm. Psalm 16, page 17, verse 8, before me constantly. Before me constantly, I set the Lord alone, because he is at my right hand, I'll not be of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.